I would like to call upon Mr. Toki Andrea Mangiato to introduce our next panel discussion. Let's put our hands together and welcome Mr. Toki Andrea Mangiato. Thank you. Thank you, Kiri. Excellence. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. La gouvernance est au cœur de la paix. Governance is at the heart of peace. Il a pas de paix durable, we cannot have sustainable peace without good governance. Cette, uh, gouvernance commence and this governance par chaque individu begins in each one of us, dans chaque famille, in each family, dans la communauté, in our communities, ce qui donne une bonne gouvernance pour un pays, which provides good governance for an entire country. Qui, si on les met ensemble, and when all put together, leads to global good governance. Liu Tao Liu Tao said in Scroll 31 of his book, The Principles of Government in Ancient China. Some of you, I'm sure, have this book in front of you. So Liu Tao once said that if a leader is not virtuous, then he risks placing his entire country in danger. He risks creating chaos among his subjects. A virtuous leader will bring about stability in the nation, stability at home and order among his subjects, destiny, the destiny of a nation hinges first and foremost upon the capability and wisdom of its leaders, not upon divine will. And this ancient wisdom shows us clearly that there is a close link between ethics and morality and good governance. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, now let us welcome the speakers and the moderator for our next panel, which is entitled Governance Issues and Creating Peace from Conflict Through Morality, Ethics, and Causality Education. I now would like to ask the moderator of this panel to come to the stage and have a seat. His Excellency, Mr. Ahmad Jalali, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary Permanent Delegate of the Islamic Republic of Iran to UNESCO. And now, I invite Dr. Dov Lynch the Chief of Section for the Section of Global Citizenship and Peace Education at UNESCO and its education sector, as well as His Excellency, Mr. Flavio Mendes, Ambassador and Permanent Delegate of the Republic of Panama to UNESCO, Your Excellency, please. I also invite Her Excellency, Madam Mariam Katagum, the Ambassador and Permanent Delegate of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to UNESCO. And we will also have joining us the Venerable Wu Xin 
who is arriving very soon and will join this panel. Your Excellency, Mr. President, now give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Ahmad Jalali, who will be moderating this panel. Merci. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to be here again on the, this occasion. Okay, uh, I am the moderator, I'm not the speaker. I have to encourage uh, the speakers to try to find each other's links to the concept. Uh, here is a house of intellectuality, means we are trying to reach the concepts. Governance uh, issue in creating peace of, out of conflict through morality, ethics, and causality uh, education. If you look at the core of the issue of uh, governance, good governance, we come to this very brief uh, itemization of the issue, the legitimacy of the public realm. This is one chapter. Power distribution between those who govern and those who are governed. Second. Then, dialogue and negotiation process between groups of shakeholders. I can assure you that what I found in my experience here in this house and in the world, in different regions, and my studies is that without dialogue, without the possibility of dialogue, there would be no possibility of good governance. And then, decentralization of the authorities and functions of the government. All of this to take care of. We need the spirit of morality and the ethical code for that. How this collection could be the spirit of the masses and could continue, could secure a last, lasting peace, it would be through, only through the education. Therefore, with this brief introduction, uh, we can find the conceptual interlinkage of the topic of the items included in the topic, governance, creating peace in conflicts, morality, ethics, and causality education. Therefore, I will sit down then and will invite colleagues to, to talk about that, and then we will share the ideas. We'll share among the speakers, and among the audience. Thank you. Good afternoon. Ambassador, permanent delegate of the Islamic Republic of Iran to UNESCO, excellencies, ambassadors, and permanent delegates, ladies and gentlemen, venerable Wu Xin. My name is uh, Dove Lynch, and I'm the uh, Chief of Section for Global Citizenship and Peace Education in the education sector at UNESCO. I'm deeply honored to be here today. Uh, I wish to thank the permanent delegation of the Côte d'Ivoire for organizing this in cooperation with the Sultanate of Oman, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the World Fellowship of Buddhists, Pure Land Learning College Association, and the Association of Master Ching Kung's 
friends at UNESCO. This topic is relevant, I believe, because our world is undergoing such deep transformations. Climate change is accelerating across the globe. Inequalities are deepening between and within societies. Humanity is on the move like never before, often, unfortunately, at force. Societies everywhere are undergoing deep transformation, seeing also the rise of new forms of populist politics, including, unfortunately, sometimes virulent and exclusive forms of nationalism. We see conflicts enduring, tearing at the heart of societies, causing humanitarian tragedies, spreading violence and hatred. We see devastating terrorist attacks in countries across the world and the rise of different forms of violent extremism. The world is getting younger every day, we know, and young women and men often carry the heaviest burdens of change. At the same time, the digital revolution is making the world ever more interconnected. This is opening vast new avenues for cooperation and dialogue, for exchanges and innovation. But we know this also comes with challenges, and notably in the shape of violent extremist ideologies, conspiracy theories that seek to disseminate hatred, to divide societies, to fuel tension sometimes, including on cultural and religious lines. In this context, I believe we see all the more the importance of the role of UNESCO and the mission of UNESCO. This is the mission to build peace in the minds of men in new ways, not only through political agreements between governments, but more importantly, by starting in the minds of young women and men, working through soft power, working through cooperation and dialogue through solidarity. This is the importance of education, to empower young minds with skills for critical thinking, with opportunities for civic engagement, with competences for intercultural dialogue. This is why we say at UNESCO that building peace must start on the benches of schools. This is the importance of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and specifically Sustainable Development Goal 4 in education. This is about access to all to education and lifelong learning, but it is also about the quality and the relevance of learning, including the commitment by all countries to advance what we call at UNESCO global citizenship education. This is not about citizenship in the legal sense. It's about learning to live on a planet which is under pressure. It's about learning to live together in societies in deep transformation through new skills of cultural literacy on the basis of respect for others and equal dignity. Led forward by UNESCO, global citizenship education seeks to empower learners to assume active roles in facing and tackling both local and global challenges so that they become proactive contributors to a more peaceful, tolerant, and inclusive, and secure world. For women and young women and men to become aware, as the great Rumi said, you are not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. Being a global citizen today calls for new ways of seeing the world, new ways of thinking and behaving. Being a global citizen today means sharing the wealth of cultural and linguistic diversity as a force of renewal and belonging and innovation. These are the goals guiding UNESCO's work in supporting countries across the world and taking forward global citizenship education. For UNESCO, global citizenship education should provide cognitive, but not only cognitive skills, also social, emotional, and behavioral skills to help learners understand the features and dynamics of local and global developments, but also to act for solidarity and peace. This vision is taken forward at the global level through the 2030 Agenda and is being taken and implemented by countries across the world. At the same time, we see challenges to the implementation of global citizenship education. These are explored in a recent publication, which is called Global Citizenship Education, The Rise of Nationalist Perspectives. With the support of APSU, our Category 2 Center, and Korean National Commission for UNESCO, as well as the UNESCO Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. There is the tension between the local and the global. Global citizenship education is sometimes seen as an ideal that over-prioritizes the global over local needs, especially at a time when borders are increasingly sharp. It is not obvious to somehow global citizenship education is relevant to national citizenship. 
And there's also some confusion about the very notion of what global citizenship might mean. Second is challenge, there's difficulty of challenging environments. Global citizenship education is sometimes seen as a luxury, especially in countries that are experiencing conflicts, in countries that are facing deep challenges of poverty and social cohesion. And lastly, there's the implementation challenge. Implementing global citizenship education is complex, is daunting because of its complexity, because of the changes it requires, especially for teachers who are perhaps not equipped to teach all three dimensions of learning. So global citizenship education is today something of a contested concept, especially in regions where global, the notions of global and globalization are associated with Western and Westernization. The question we face is how can we overcome these challenges to promote education for peace? And there are many levels of solution in government policy and priority, political priority and teacher training. Part of the answer lies at the conceptual level and showing the links between national, traditional concepts and the ideas at the heart of global citizenship education. And this is the purpose of the new publication that we launched this, this month in Seoul, which is called Global Citizenship Education Taking It Local, with the support of APSU again. Our goal with this is very simple. It's to identify local concepts that convey similar notions to global citizenship education, to move beyond the, the notion, the semantic term of global citizenship education, to show that global citizenship education is not a new concept, but a long shared aspiration of societies across the world. To show that global citizenship education is not something foreign or Western, but actually has deep local roots. In this publication, we highlight the connections between the core notions at the heart of global citizenship education, solidarity, a shared sense of, of, of humanity, respect for diversity, and very important national concepts and principles, such as Ubuntu in Southern Africa, like the Charte de Mondain in Mali. All of this work is essential to build the defenses of resilience against hatred and violence. This is why UNESCO is providing guidance to policymakers and teachers to build global citizenship education into education systems, into curricula, into classrooms. This is why UNESCO is supporting countries and training teacher trainers. This is why we're preparing tools to prevent violent extremism through education, to help teachers understand, decrypt, address in classrooms a range of controversial issues, such as anti-refugee migrant discourses, such as myths, rumors, and conspiracy theories, such as discrimination against Muslims, such as anti-Semitism. In all of this, the role of the broader community outside classrooms is essential. Everyone is concerned. Everyone must be engaged. Families play an active role together with teachers in empowering young people to become engaged in promoting positive values. Community leaders and young people themselves have a key role to play in shaping minds and stimulating them to act for positive change. Cultural and religious leaders, and I wish to pay respect to those at UNESCO today, have a vital, sensitive, and powerful role to play in conveying messages of tolerance, respect, and peaceful coexistence. Fundamentally, the message at the heart of the UNESCO Constitution is that hard power is not enough to build peace. It is that we need soft power to prevent and counter fear, hatred, and division. It is that we need the transformative power of education. In his memoir, Long Walk to Freedom, Nelson Mandela wrote, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. And I believe this echoes the intervention of Venerable Master Chin Kung this morning on the power of education of love. And I see this as the message at the heart of all UNESCO's work to develop new forms of education for the 21st century. This is about solidarity. This is about collective intelligence. And this echoes the words of the UNESCO Director General when she said, only through our collective intelligence can we hope to solve the unprecedented challenges we're facing. On that note, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, dear Dove Lynch, uh, Chief of Section, 
section of global citizenship and peace, education, UNESCO, very, very sensitive uh, area. Uh, before I invite uh, His Excellency, our next, next speaker, Mr. Flavio Mendez, Ambassador and Permanent Delegate of the Republic of Panama to UNESCO, to take the floor. I would like to say that uh, he's going to say a few words on governance and management of uh, everyday life in a modern society. I'm sure that with a comprehensive uh, view and experience and intellectual capacity he has enjoyed during his career and his personal achievements, uh, he would try somehow to connect uh, what he wants to say in the line of what was said by our colleague from UNESCO. I would like to say that uh, uh, our next speaker, Mr. Dov Lynch, he mentioned Rumi, my favorite, and uh, he said that you are not a drop of ocean, but as a drop you are, you can be an ocean. I don't want to read the Persian, the original Persian uh, poem which uh, said this of Rumi, but the description comes when Rumi is narrating in his masterpiece, the Masnavi, that if you have a limited boundary, like a pot of water, if somebody poured the whole sea into this little pot, which has boundaries, then the sea will not remain on that except for the water of one or two days. But if you go the reverse method, mean you break the walls and the limits of the pot and pour the water of the small pot into the ocean, then that would be the ocean. And this is something that, as it was said, we have to learn through education. But we talk about that, it is not to, so easy to transfer. What is said here in the outline of the UNESCO agenda, in the education sector, how to transfer that in day-to-day -day life? Ambassador of Panama is going to tell us management of everyday life in a modern society. Ambassador. Um, first of all, I'm very honored to be in this panel. Uh, my, uh, the reason I'm here is because I uh, was invited by Master Shin Kun uh, to converse, to have conversation about life. And um, along that conversation, uh, he found out that uh, the delegation of Panama uh, for several years, until about a year and a half ago, I've been here six years, was comprised of uh, the great amount uh, of diplomats and staff of one. It is, of course, the smallest delegation or diplomatic mission that can exist. So up to about a year and a half, there was only one diplomat, myself, uh, no secretary, no staff, nobody else, but a very empty room. Nevertheless, the delegation is very active. And uh, the conversation rose, how did you do it? How, 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 how was the work done? 
And I said that I had a system of life. Uh, I was a public servant, and uh, I have applied that system. But before I get into the detail of what is the system, I have to give you a little background so you can understand why I have to, to sort of create that very basic system. Um, I am a third generation diplomat. I was born, of course, somewhere else, not in my country. Uh, by the age of uh, 10, I, was, I had already gone through four elementary schools uh, in different languages. Um, those of you that had that experience, at least with one change of elementary school, you can imagine four. Um, Luckily, in the last one, um, it was my home country, Panama, uh, where I changed of two schools. And this last school was a Catholic school. I had the luck of having a priest from Spain that took his time to teach me Spanish, starting with as simple as I am, you are, he is. And, and at that moment, it was a little confusing because the way I spoke, I am, you are, he is, was in a Portuguese, but in a part of Brazil, which is Rio, that when I say, I am going to your house, on that region in Rio, we can say, we are going to your house, meaning I. So I couldn't understand in Spanish why I was in us. We are going to your house. So anyway, it was uh, the best way to learn. And uh, Master Kung, as you know, is also a great leader in interfaith um, conversation and communication. So I learned the Spanish. And eventually, I, followed, I fell in a group of books called Tesoro de la Juventud, Treasures of Youth. And in those books, I found out that life was, according to the books, full of great news. There was history of heroic acts, poetry, um, fables of Esopo. It was, it was very rich, but it was always beautiful things to read. So I grew with a mind of beautiful things happen in life, and you should pursue happiness. And the end of the story should be happiness. So I was a very happy child, adolescent an adult. But I dreamt that my life would be like that. So later in life, I simply waited to, to see if a princess will appear in my life, uh, not seeking for. And the princess did appear right in front of me, although she didn't know for some time. Actually, she's sitting right there. <laughs> 33 years later. Uh, together. As soon as I got into the diplomatic service, I got into the reality of how we have to work. As public servants, we have a duty and a responsibility to others. It's not what we want, but it's what must be done in favor of the states and the order that you receive. It's difficult because sometimes principles and, and instructions and what you have to do, it, they clash, but you have to be very clear in how you have to work. I realized that that life was going to be complicated and difficult. Uh, with, uh, and as a junior diplomat, constantly changing the time schedule. So at a very young age on our marriage, I realized that the most important part was family. Of course, we all know that. But how do you handle your life so it can work out very well? I decided to divide, and this is the part of the governance of the speech of my intervention that I hope it can help some, hope I can inspire some. Uh, I divided the day in three parts. One is the administrative day, my administrative duties. The other one is the political day, meaning not doing politics, but the, uh, the man is a politician by itself talking to their peers. So the second one was the political day, 
hour. And the third was the family. So we have administrative times, we have political times, and we have family times. I divided the day basically as much as I could that in the morning I will have to do, or in the beginning of the day, whatever the day was, depending on the situation, always to do the administrative section and not to be interrupted, not to give meetings, not to answer telephones, and try to get rid of all the documentation that had to be signed and all the decision processes. The political part, it goes by default. It has to do with remembering that you are part of a group and you have to take care of that group too. You have to see your colleagues, the people that work under you, the people that work above you. Little details as happy birthdays or visiting somebody within your group that has a sick member of the family. Sometimes we forget about that and we neglect that part of the job. And remember, they're all part of, of our working environment. That I will leave it for the afternoon because that way I know that along the day, if there was any other change on the information or on any other decision that was done, somebody can consult me, the secretary or my people, the staff that work with me. Then it came the family time. How it worked, it's very simple. I would put family time always above the other two. That meant that, to give you examples, at the end of the day we had diplomatic activities. My secretary had the instruction of calling my wife and ask her if we had any family meetings. The reason I have to say that is because they have 10 brothers and sisters, my wife. You can see it's a big battalion. And then I have a bunch of them. So it's a large group. So the answer was yes, no. And depending on if we have any birthday from the children or the grandchildren of them, depending on the, all those years that we lived, then the secretary will tell me if I could go to that reception or to that meeting in the evening and how many hours I should go. It's just to say greeted or, or to stay because family was first above all those things. And it worked along the years. Of course, it's not perfect. Many things are mm, not being done perfectly. Sometimes I had to choose not to take good posts Although they would look excellent for my career, I felt, just felt, without any tangible reason, I felt it was not the best for the family. So I neglected to accept those posts. In the end, 33 years later and two children, and two months ago a grand granddaughter, um, in retrospective, he had worked incredibly well the system. Our children are doing, at each stage of their lives, I could say they're doing better than us. They're very proud. And the more that I can mm, see that that worked, the better I have realized that I was a good public servant during my duty. Because the family was well, and therefore the state benefits from that. Uh, I try to share this with all the peers that work with me uh, in the last 10 years. This is, not, this is something that I discovered years ago. And, uh, and well, this is the reason I'm, I was talking to you here. I hope that has been some help. Give you a little of the treasure of my youth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Mendes. Thank you very much. You uh, offered a practical plan how to bring that education into the life. But uh, in the because uh, I envy your style of uh, life many times, and. Um, 
I should say this, that in the beginning you mentioned that uh, until one year ago or something, your delegation were no staff, no secretary, no colleague, nothing, but it was working very well. You should have, you should have said that. Then wh what was the, uh, the factor that it would work? I knew. It, uh, she is there, you know. That's that, that, the engine behind everything. Okay. Thank you very much. We, we have to talk about that uh, later on. Now, um, I would like to invite uh, one of the very, very active uh, ambassadors, uh, more than ambassador, uh, she is a real partner of UNESCO for many years, even before she became ambassador. She was a partner, and uh, you can see her in anywhere that we need uh, time and uh, we need encouragement. Uh, uh, Madam Mariam Katagun, uh, Ambassador and Permanent Delegate of uh, the Federal Republic of uh, Nigeria to UNESCO. She is going to talk about governance for development and peace. I'm thinking, uh, I think that uh, she's one of the very competent figures to talk about that because uh, she was in a position in different stages from years ago in different gathering and development of the ideas in UNESCO about uh, the issue and her, not her position, but her personal career and personal experience uh, will be a great help. Madam Ambassador, please. Before, before she starts uh, in this uh, 10 seconds, I should say that uh, fortunately there are the very enthusiastic uh, figures here gathering uh, I have to recognize uh, many, many distinguished colleagues here. At least two of them I see in front of uh, Michael, our uh, previous chair of the executive board and a uh, very good contributor to the development of ideas here. And distinguished ambassador of Oman, he is there. Uh, in the whole area, you know, you have seen the exhibition. She was very active. Thank you. Madam, Madam Ambassador. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Um, I'm going to speak on governance for development and peace, but with a slant in the sense that I'm revisiting the roles of traditional institutions in Africa. So I'm not exactly going the UNESCO way. I'm looking back Woods to Africa. Um, excellencies, ambassadors, permanent delegates, distinguished fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Nigeria is greatly honored to be a co-organizer of this conference. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to highlight the need for the promotion of dialogue between traditional African institutions and the modern state for the enhancement of good governance, for development and peace in Africa. With, us, with such a dialogue and resulting education, we shall be creating peace out of the existing conflict between the two systems of governance. As a result undertaken by African countries in the late 1980s and early 1990s, economic and political governance in the region has improved considerably. However, the prevailing rate of poverty and other socioeconomic indicators are evidence of the development challenges faced in Africa. Ethnic, religious, and civil conflicts also abound with frequent electoral and post-electoral strife. According to the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, there are 12.6 million African internally displaced persons at the end of 2016. In the, first months, in the first six months of 2017, an additional 2.7 million people have been internally displaced. Most of the time, internal displacement 
is not the result of natural disasters. Conflicts caused 75% of new displacements so far in 2017. Therefore, the primary driver of internal displacement is politics in the context of poor governance. The Mo Ibrahim Foundation defines governance as the provision of the political, social, and economic public goods and services that every citizen has the right to expect from their state and that a state has the responsibility to deliver to its citizens. The foundation has developed the Ibrahim Index for African Governance, which is a tool that measures and monitors governance in African countries across four key components, safety and rule of law, participation and human rights, sustainable economic opportunity and human development. One of the key findings of the 2017 IIAG report is that one third of the countries driving overall improvement in African governance fail to build on prior progress. It goes on to state that while the majority of countries improve in overall governance over the last 10 years, half of these show this progress to either be slackening or trends showing signs of reversal with serious decline in the last five years. Africa's improvement, in average, has therefore slowed down. And this slow progress is reflected in the governance categories of this foundation. This poor performance in governance has led to research initiatives aimed at contributing to and stimulating debate on governance and development and the relationship between the two. Many of such studies argue that externally imposed good governance, in quotes, make unrealistic assumptions about the choices leaders and officials are in practice able to make. As a result, reform initiatives fail while ignoring the potential for addressing the causes rather than the symptoms of the situation. There is therefore a need for fresh policy thinking or new ways of envisioning good governance in the region. Therefore, a number of studies have affirmed the relevance and legitimacy of institutions of traditional leadership. Large segments of the population, especially in rural areas, continue to adhere to traditional institutions in spite of the provisions of the Western-style modern state. This fragmentation of the institutions of governance, it is argued, has contributed to Africa's crisis of governance and development. To reverse the crisis, the existing duality has to be addressed by exploring ways to reform and integrate the two parallel institutions. Traditional institutions, you'll agree with me, represent the history, culture, traditions, and governance systems. So they're indispensable to facilitating democratic transformation and socioeconomic development. Contrary to the general belief, there is a convergence of traditional political values with modern democratic governance. Such values of the traditional system include direct participation in decision making, resolution of conflicts by narrowing differences in order to establish peace and harmony and to prevent future feuds, narrowing the gap between the rulers and the ruled through direct participation of all adults in making and enforcing rules, and most importantly, respect for dissent and protection of minority views and interests by requiring consensus on decisions. The Economic Commission for Africa, and uh, here I'm just going to give an ex uh, a few examples. Within the framework of the Pro Project Governance for a Progressing Africa has identified some key roles played by traditional authorities. The first role is advisory to national governments particularly in terms of regional and district levels. Secondly, they have a de developmental role in supporting government's efforts in mobilizing the population for the implementation of current development projects, such as when you have um, vaccination campaigns, you want to popularize girls and women's education and so on. Thirdly, traditional institutions play a prominent role in conflict resolution through intercultural and interreligious dialogue, thereby ensuring peaceful coexistence 
in the society. Now I'm going to um, quickly take three examples from three traditional institutions from different parts of uh, Nigeria. And I'm using this to demonstrate how these traditional institutions are still valid and how they can um, have a value addition to the modern system of governance. My first example is from the House of Fulani governance system in northern Nigeria. Traditionally, the House of Fulani governance system is hierarchical. You have the blacksmiths, the cobblers at the bottom of the uh, pyramid, and the emir and his counselors at the peak. Governance is conducted through a system of ranked and titled offices known as Sarautu. That is, Sarauta is singular Sarautu, titles. The emir also has his dogare, that is, the local police, his own palace guards, who also ensure enforcement of codes of ethics and protocol. He also has an alkali, who is the legal, the chief judge, and who from time to time consults the emir in terms of dispensation of justice. But what is important, the emir and his counselors are originally scholars, having been sent or enrolled at a very early age in the Islamic schools. So they are taught the religion. They are told, taught the ethics of the society. So a lot of the administrative aspect has to do with them teaching. They are, in a way, teaching uh, the communities how to follow the ways of the religion or the teachings of the prophet in this case. As the leader of the people, the emir provides guidance to the counselors and is responsible for maintenance of stability during times of crisis in his domain. Now, the second example um, that I'm going to go to quickly is the Yoruba in the western part of Nigeria. You have the Yoruba tradition where you have an Oba, an Oba is also the head, and he is assisted by a council of chiefs. And this council has powers to enact legislation for the effective and good governance of the people and for taking decisions pertaining to waging of war and so on and so forth. Now the Oba on, in council adjudicates on serious crimes such as murder and treason, but less offenses fall within the competences of the district or the village heads. Although the Oba is regarded as the supreme leader, most of his decisions are taken after due consultations with the chiefs. The third example is that of the Igbo traditional society in Eastern Nigeria, which is quite different from the two. Chinua Achebe's famous book, Things Fall Apart, a novel that has been translated into more than 50 languages, captures the essence of the traditional Igbo society before the arrival of the white man, or colonialism. Now, in a paper, Namani in 2003 informs that Igbo society, like some African societies, is sometimes described as acephalous. These are territorial communities united by the rule of law, but lacking a distinct head, without a leader, societies in which the largest political unit embraces a group of people, all of whom are tied by ties, they are united by ties of kinship, not that there is a head, they are all kith and kin. This is an institution based on communal solidarity, collective action, horizontal political structure, which places premium on leadership rather than authority, and the absence of role specialization or class differentiation. This system of governance is based on the community, that is the village or the clan, headed by a council of elders. Governance is based on agreed laws by the community, as defined by the community. And in Igbo land, the governance, the agreed laws are enforced by the Ekpe society or the Okonko. These are like traditional police. Now, one thing that's very interesting about this community is in terms of development, they believe, they have the philosophy that nobody leaves his brother behind, or that um, they are their brother's keeper. So whatever happens, they have to work, act collectively. 
So community development, that is in terms of, I'm now linking governance and development, is carried out through a committee of friends or age grades. If you are born the same year, that age grade, those that were born 1980, they keep in touch. Any development effort, that age grade will come to the community and say, we are going to construct the road from here to there. And that is the contribution of our age grade. Or kingsmen acting collectively to go and work on somebody's farm. Now, the other interesting thing about this society is conflict resolution. The way conflicts are resolved is best described, and I borrowed an Igbo proverb. And that proverb literally means, instead of a wrestling match turning into a fight, let the rain fall. Now, you imagine a village square, and there is a wrestling match. And it looks like the emotions are getting high. That wrestling match is about to become a fight rather than a wrestling match. So they will say, it's better for the rain to fall because since we're all outside and the rain falls, that means everybody will go home. So rather than a wrestling match turning into a fight, let the rain fall. So the community, uh, you find that um, they have these mechanisms that they've put in place, as I've talked about the local police, I've talked about the, perhaps the Council of Elders, but a distinct addition is the collar nut. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the collar nut, but in Igbo land, the collar nut is a symbol of peace. If there is conflict, if there is uh, somebody going to apologize to the other, he will take a piece of the collar nut. And that collar nut has to be broken into pieces by an elder because they also respect their elders. So he who brings collar brings life. And I encourage you all to read uh, this book by Chino Achebe. Now to conclude, um, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to affirm the point made in my opening statement that we need a program to promote dialogue between the traditional and modern systems of government. Such a program should first of all include efforts to inform and educate the youths on the moral values and ethics of traditional societies and institutions. So education is key. The program should also educate government officials and parliamentarians on the traditional systems of governance with a view to highlighting the convergence between the two. Let me therefore end with a quotation from The Governing Principles of Ancient China, one of my favorite books now, uh, verse 238 on page 289 of the first volume, talking about caring for people. And I quote, for those who bring benefits to the world, the world will also bring benefits to them. For those who bring harm to the world, the world will also bring harm to them. A benevolent leader, a benevolent ruler, will attract the populace to follow him because he is, a, he is good at bringing benefits to the world. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, dear Ambassador. As usual, uh, you illuminated us in a very, very interesting and uh, a uh, wide range of experience that is really related to UNESCO, is really related. Uh, the relation is that in the Constitution, we have say, we, we say that in the Constitution of UNESCO, that ignorance of the people from the other people's ways of lives will often break to war. This, this was a way of life that how traditionally uh, people can solve. And then another branch of UNESCO is there to create, to preserve this diversity of cultures and to even to inscribe them as a cultural heritage, intangible cultural heritage, the customs, the way that we are going uh, to solve uh, this uh, uh, problem. 
And uh, of course, uh, we don't have time now, but after, I think we, we may have time to, that I ask the panelists that uh, when this international, Madam Ambassador, when this international wrestling match is going to break to war, how you can pray for an, a universal rain to calm down? This is a big question. Okay. We need a universal rain. Now, uh, the last speaker I would like, you know that uh, the whole uh, program, this wonderful program of uh, today's International Peace Conference, uh, um, different partners have shared, you know that, uh, and I would like to thank them again, uh, a permanent delegation of the Sultans of Oman, uh, our distinguished colleague Samira is sitting here, permanent delegation of the Federal Republic of Nigeria that you have seen the speech of the ambassador, and um, other associations, uh, and uh, the, the, the blessing of Master Ching Kung. Now we are going to have the vice, uh, uh, the vice uh, executive president of uh, this PAHD association, means Association of Master Ching Kung Friends at UNESCO. He is going to talk to us about fostering peace and harmony through religious education. Uh, Honorable Bo Xin, please. Uh, distinguished organizers and members that helped to host this conference. I'd like to issue my respects to all of the honored guests, all of the representatives of different faiths that are present here today. Good afternoon to all of you, Amitofo. Now today, we are very grateful to have the opportunity at UNESCO to have this platform. Basically, we have an office here that's called the Association of Friends of Master Chin Kung. Now, we are all uh, rather senior monks. I'm sure you've met all of us. This association is a relatively new when we see that our master still comes every day uh, to work. And I joke with him and say that apparently it's the mode now to keep going to work when you're 90 something years old. Now, actually, the venerable master, you can see that he works every day and he's actually extremely healthy. His mind is perfectly lucid and he's quite happy. He doesn't seem like a man of 90 some years of age. And that is because. He has a natural gift and ambition in his heart. He hopes that he can see the world be safe and peaceful. And this is someone who truly loves the world. And this person, this love for the world is the defining characteristic of our master's heart. How does he love the world? You can see that our master, when he goes to work, will speak with various other experts and masters, interact with them, and he will then express his concept of peace and share it in order to resolve conflicts and speak on a theoretical basis with other people. In addition, every day he has to demonstrate his love for people. He says that now he does not teach scripture. 
he talks about how God loves the world, rather. And this means that he takes all of the classics, the great concepts of various religions with regard to world peace, and he looks at how they demonstrate God's love for the world, and he has formed an anthology of uh, these concepts. So every day when he goes to work, he speaks with these other masters, and every day he expounds upon God's love for the world. And that is why he is so healthy, why his mind is still so sharp. It's because he loves the world. And so when there's love in your heart, you will never age, you will never fall ill. And today we talk about long life and prosperity. We talk about happiness, beauty, and joy. All of this is encapsulated in this concept of loving the world. Our Venerable Master often tells us what religion really is. This is the question that many people are asking. Religion is love. Every god of every religion, they all have to love the world and its people. And this represents the epitome of religious teachings. Now today, we are talking about studying religion. And this means learning about God and the world and God's love for the world. Place that love inside our own hearts and represent God in our love for other people. And this is what our Venerable Master Chin Kung has been able to achieve. Now, in the East, being able to bring back these traditional religious teachings and having a religious renaissance in the West as well, this could lead to world peace. And this is what we monks have been working toward over the past few years, the greatest task we have at hand. Now, of course, we are quite concerned about religion. We believe that right now religion and religious teachers are becoming less and less present. We are not able to uh, train and bring forth the young people that we would like to. That's a source of great concern to us. Now, we would like to see religious education become widespread throughout the world to resolve disputes and to correct wrong ways of thinking. This is something that we need to bring about, bring about through implementing the lessons we've learned in sacred scriptures and in embodying God's love for the world. And now, in England, we, are, we have a program focused on how to teach uh, English educators about these Eastern spiritual teachings and theories. And therefore, in religious education, what we need more than ever now is uh, everyday efforts and more people being involved to further disseminate our ideas and thus embody the mercifulness of God the mission given to us by God, that is to transform this earth into a paradise, to make it into a heaven. And this is the overarching goal of anyone who loves the world. Now, how can we actually achieve this? Well, in fact, peace, safety, and happiness, all of these come from the hearts of man. And so, if we can maintain the pure initial desires and, and the pure nature of our souls, we will be able to achieve an ideal world. In other words, the various communities of the world may follow different beliefs, but if you follow their ideas back to the source, then you can see that, in fact, the responsibilities, the duties that they teach are all based on compassion for other people. For example, 
you look at father-son relations when this when the child first comes into this world it is quite small and weak but then you look at its emotions its feelings toward its parents you can see from its eyes and its expression the love a child has for its parents and then based on this love you can build up toward a love for all of humanity not just parents and this can actually bring about peace on earth so we have to collectively promote this concept of love and teach it we need to actively promote comprehensive religious education and teaching of ethics and morality this is the only way to resolve disputes between uh, religions countries and other groups and so the most important thing is to study to learn from each other to learn about each religions most precious scriptures and texts and that's why this book about loving the world is so important now these masters all have great wisdom timeless wisdom that are not limited by country borders or by community limits or by the limits of their groups the idea is that they are part of our global heritage as humanity so in this chaotic era we are pushing to expand this concept of ethics morality and love and we hope that modern science and media will pick up on and disseminate these ideas and they will influence the entire world now ever since September 11th since those attacks the world has been plunged into deep insecurity and instability especially in certain areas where we see an increasing number of conflicts so all of us as citizens of the world are hoping and thirsting for peace and safety but where do they come from and where do the roots of conflict lie these roots do not lie in external factors they are within us so we believe that nature is essentially harmonious just like our bodies from the beginning work harmoniously and are healthy that is our true nature and therefore the founder of Buddhism he the first thing that he said was that the world and all of its creatures have the same wisdom radiance and harmony as God has given it it's simply that we are led astray by all of the trivial matters the worldly matters of this world and that is why we are unable to fully make use of it and this means that our basic nature was pure to begin with harmonious to begin with now Confucianism in China also speaks about this idea saying that actually people's nature is uh, in the beginning it is calm it is correct it's righteous but then how do we stray from that it is because of our tendency toward conflict it's a sort of pollution coming from the external world after our birth and therefore this harmony this peace is spoiled and replaced by disputes and confrontation so now in order to restore peace we have to start from our own inner souls we have to make sure that we resolve our own internal um, our cognitive dissonance we need to exert control over what we can control in ourselves we must set aside our base desires our hatred this is the only way that we can truly 
resolve all the conflicts in the world from their source and restore a true and lasting peace. Now, there was once someone who said that, that there's a person talking to another person and he asks, how is it that your household is so peaceful and harmonious? Everyone gets along so well and is so happy. Whereas in my family, we're always arguing and bickering. She said, he said, why is it that your household is so harmonious? The other person responded and said, it's because everyone in my family is a bad person. And in your household, everyone is a good person. Since everyone is bad in my household, we're all harmonious with each other. But you are all good people. That's why you argue every day. Now, why is that? Well, that's because bad people, evil people, when they've done something wrong, they will acknowledge that they've done it wrong because they were evil to begin with. And the other person whom they've offended will say, actually, no, I'm evil. I'm bad, so it's my fault too. And that's why, in the end, that household of bad people was quite harmonious. Now let's say you're a household of noble, good people. They will all defer responsibility and say, this couldn't have been my fault, I'm a good person, and so on and so forth. And that's how they end up arguing all the time. So the point of this anecdote is that today we are trying to resolve conflicts and confrontations. And to do so, we have to truly acknowledge our faults. We have to repent and be willing to bring about changes to rectify our behavior. And that is the only way, uh, only solution for a harmonious household. And that's why we say that peace and security come from the inside, from one's heart. Now, in Buddhism, we have a saying that says everything is new. Essentially, our thoughts, all of the concepts we think of will has an, will have an effect on everything in the external world. And this is a very profound thought. For example, when dreaming, we know that everyone dreams. And let's say that on a given day, we are in an excellent mood, and at night you have a wonderful, pleasant dream. But if we're constantly worried or thinking about negative things, if we want revenge against others, if we want to hurt others, then what will you dream about at night? You'll have nightmares. What will you dream about? People who are against you, who want to harm you, who want to kill you, and you'll be living in fear. And when you wake up, you won't feel feel good either. You won't feel rested. And so you have good dreams versus nightmares. And where do they come from? It comes from one's own inner thoughts. All of the landscapes and characters of our dreams come from what is in our heart. And now science is actually proving this point. For example, we've been carrying out studies on water crystals for a very long time. A famous Japanese professor has carried out laboratory studies and found that people's thoughts can actually change the structure of water molecules, which means that if you think about wonderful, compassionate things, then the crystal structure will become extremely beautiful. But if you think about evil, hateful things, then the structure will become ugly. For example, if you tape a label saying peace onto one uh, glass of water and add a, a fix a label saying war to a different water glass and then you use a microscope to examine the structure of the liquid, you can see that the water crystals in the peace labeled glass is beautiful, whereas the structure in the other glass labeled war is ugly. And this shows that our own thoughts can impact our external environment. Now, today, our hearts are not compassionate, and that is why our environment is not doing well either. So let's all think about that. Perhaps this concept about people's thoughts changing actual external matter, if this idea could perhaps 
provide a new line of thought for us. That is to say, we need to purify our environment by purifying our own hearts. We work for peace today. How can we achieve peace? The most important thing is to eliminate internal conflicts, internal anxiety and disputes. This is the only way to achieve external peace. Now, Venerable Master Chin Kung will often say that our hearts do not actually have any confrontation. That seems simple, but it's actually quite profound. The lack of confrontation essentially is harmony. That's why he respects everyone so much, because he thinks everyone is a Buddhist monk, is a Buddha. And this is what the founder of Buddhism said as well. And so today, we now need to strengthen harmony and security in society, working toward universal peace, but based on resolving the conflicts in our own hearts. There is a famous Buddhist proverb saying that when the heart is calm, our environment, our world also becomes calm. And so how does, where does heaven come from? It comes from within. So the way that we can seek peace today lies within ourselves. This is what we want to share with everyone today. Thank you very much. Amit Chafal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Venerable Bushin. Important and uh, a wide range of uh, points that could be could together uh, built up a structure for approach uh, to think of how religiosity can culminate to the creation of peace. Uh, there are excellent points that I can refer to, and I, I'm sure that uh, our panelists, but there is uh, only a few minutes left of our time because we started a little, uh, about 10, 15 minutes late. Uh, I, I, I prefer that with the permission of panelists to give the floor to the audience in this short time if you have any comment or question to contribute to the gathering. Anyone from the audience? Silence is not a bad uh, sign. Uh, mean that they're contemplating. Oh, is there? Yes. Madam, you have the floor. Alors, merci pour ce moment. Thank you very much for this extraordinary presentation, very rich in content. I come from Canada, and we talk a great deal with our indigenous communities trying to promote reconciliation. And the most important component of this reconciliation is the return to earth, return to one's origins. And we seem to have lost this connection with our ecosystems and with nature. So through this dialogue that surrounds us, how do you view the role of Mother Earth? Thank you very much. Very deep, very deep question, uh, and a, a question of the day. Uh, anyone of our colleagues would like to react? Perhaps you in your section or ambassador? How? <laughs> Thank you very much. This is indeed a fundamental question. 
that perhaps is a bit different from the education sector's mandate. It has to do with sustainable development. And I'm not going to speak for that sector because it's not my personal uh, section or a specialty. But that section is indeed, our section is dedicated to education, which is very important for uh, building up this rapport with our planet, a planet under ever increasing pressure. Uh, you're seeing, we see new evidence of this every day from guides for policymakers to textbooks and classrooms. And uh, I can talk to you more about this on the sidelines of this conference about this very important work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other point? Uh, may I add just one uh, point with the said that um, your question uh, reminds us of, of the need for a paradigm shift or at least reviewing the different paradigms which has governed our society, our minds in the last one and a half century. In 19th century, there was a concept of progress. That progress was a train that if any nation does not jump on that train, will be forgotten. So progress, progress, progress. Then finally we come in the middle of uh, 20th century that uh, with that notion of progress, that paradigm, we are making another planet, another way of life. Then we decided to think of development instead of progress. Then development took, the paradigm of development took this place. And the main component of that paradigm was uh, economic success industrial success. Just, it was in 80s, early 80s, that Javier Perez de Coyar, the Secretary General of the United Nations, he appointed a group of people, wise people. It was in 1988. He appointed a group of people to perform a deep studies that between the culture and development, shall we leave the culture, shall we leave the economic uh, success to just to run, to march on our life, and we don't think of culture? The absence of culture was the real, the reason that he appointed that group. The result of 10 years of that group, eminent group, was manifested in the conference of 1998, after 10 years, in Stockholm. UNESCO did that. Federico Mayor, at that time, was Director General of UNESCO. And you can see the report, the role of culture, and that, then they found out that the real component for uh, the development to be permanent, sustainable, is including the element of culture. Now we are facing with another, uh, another uh, a bigger challenge. Now we are facing with this question, yes, we thought of market economy, then we came to market industry, then even market democracy, and market culture. And that was the reason that here in this room, after four years of challenges, they approved the famous Convention of Cultural Diversity and 
preservation of the artistic expressions of the world. All of these uh, will introduce a new paradigm uh, shift, but who is going to decide about that and create the political will behind that? Any, any friend would like to add something? However, there is no time, otherwise uh, we could discuss more. I hope you... you uh, uh, we didn't answer your question. That, uh, we tried to say that the question is much deeper than we can answer now. Any other? Yes, please. Uh, 京都から共和参加をさせていただきました。え、トンシー水港中西水港と申します。え、とりわけ、え、ウシンファースの方に。We apologize the question was asked in Japanese. We don't have Japanese interpreting today. あの、中国語で、え、私の言葉を通訳していただきたいと思います。お釈迦様、釈尊は、え、え、心を清ければ there is no Japanese interpretation available. There is no Japanese translation. There それを、え、人工ファースが世界の平和の構築のために私たちの心を清めるということが大切なんだということを示しご説法してくださっております。それをお、ウシンファースが今日はご説法してくださって心から感謝申し上げたいと思います。ここにこの世界の平和の大きな え、私たちの心を清めていくということが世界の平和の大きなえ、これからの大切なことやるということを感謝を申し上げまして、運心さんの今日の話に感謝を申し上げたいと思います。え、それでは通訳していただきます。and that way we can have interpretation into English. So I'm going to interpret now. I come from uh, Japan. Makanishi Chiku is my name. And I have a response to the 50-minute uh, presentation just now. I'd first like to express my gratitude for it. And the master mentioned a uh, sentence from the uh, Buddhist scriptures, which is, if your heart is clean, uh, then your beliefs are clear as well. And we believe that this is a very important phrase from the scriptures. It emphasizes the importance of your actions and exemplifies the correct a spirit for creating a peaceful world. So if our heart is clear and calm, then we can have a clear action plan. So we, we, we would like to really thank you for uh, giving us a clear direction for future action. And we hope that we can uh, use your energy to move forward and feel inspired by you. So this is just a response to Venerable uh, Wu Xin's presentation. Thank you. Much. I don't know. Do we have time? Uh, another one? Yes. Uh, the three of them there. I don't know. How much do we have time? Peace and blessings on all uh, the members of the panel and uh, members of the conference. Uh, my name is Jamal Samsudin from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, representing the Pure Land Group uh, from Malaysia 
And uh, the question that I would like to put forward is, uh, I think the ambassador from Nigeria mentioned about conflict resolution. Yeah, using mediation as conflict resolution uh, versus litigation. Uh, and, and this trend is coming up significantly in some countries. For example, New Zealand has a very advanced mediation system. Uh, the question that I would like to put forward is, how do we get mediation uh, forward to become the conflict resolution of choice? I think that is uh, the challenge that we have to make. In Malaysia now, uh, what we have done is we have actually, with the International Islamic University, come up with probably the only syllabus uh, and training course in religious conflict resolution. So we have uh, a mediation course uh, that is already in place uh, for us to carry out uh, processes of mediation before it goes uh, to the courts. So the catchword is mediation, not litigation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Madam Ambassador, would you like to, to have a comment? Okay, uh, thank you very much for, it, it's a question, it's a comment, and I think it's a way forward. Uh, in fact, one of the areas I skipped in my presentation, uh, the first of the uh, traditional societies uh, uh, that I use as examples, it, it's actually considered an abomination for you to take any family matter to the court. You know, that it is expected that you would have settled the matter within the family, and it should normally be that the eldest person in the family, whether he's a father, the grandfather, or a brother, should be able to settle. And increasingly in my country, um, one, because of the backlog or the slow process of the judicial system, more and more people are moving towards alternate methods of conflict resolution. And in this case, people are coming back to associations, they are coming back to communities, and more and more uh, uh, lawyers, if I may say, are encouraging people to take alternative means of resolution, how you'll settle your matters out of court, how you'll settle uh, matters and have um, a sense of uh, would I say uh, forgiveness? Because sometimes you get justice in the courts, but then there's a lot of bitterness left on both sides. And you're also thinking of, uh, you know, the issue of uh, forgiveness. Because when uh, in some communities, well, maybe most communities, if you have an issue and it is not resolved within the community, uh, you take it to court, there is a judicial uh, pronouncement. Um, sometimes it could lead to incarceration. You also want to help that person return to the community without feeling, uh, without having bad feelings, whether from him or from members of his family. So you have to think of, uh, you know, yes, you've been wronged. Yes, there's been mediation, not litigation so that you continue to live together, uh, you know, as one. And in a way, you have peace in your heart because um, if you have a situation that goes to incarceration of the other person, when that person returns to the community or each time you meet members of the family, there is some kind of uh, hard feelings in your heart. So really, um, Alternate conflict resolution mechanisms, uh, rather than litigation, I think that should be the way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, there are lots of things and points we can make. Uh, the time is over, unfortunately. I would like to thank all of you on behalf of my colleagues here. Thank to all the panelists, and finally, a special thank to the dear organizer of uh, uh, this event, the permanent delegation of Cote d'Ivoire, 
and the distinguished ambassador of Cote d'Ivoire uh, with the cooperation with the uh, uh, Sultanate of Oman, Nigeria, the World Fellowship Buddhist, uh, the Land Learning College Association and Association of Master Ching Chung Friends at UNESCO. We learned a lot when you were speaking that how we should divide the time. You see in the family that your wife has 10 brothers and sisters that is a birthday or something. Okay, we have a lot to design. And by the way, today is my birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.